session that we are going to begin the afternoon with is uh, latest in treating neurological disability. May I now invet, in, in, invite Chairperson Dr. Manas Panigrahi, our speakers Dr. H. V. Madhusudan, Dr. Maheshwarappa, Dr. Vijay Kamath. Just to give you a brief about our, pan, uh, about our chairperson and speakers, Dr. Manas Panigrahi is a senior consultant neurosurgeon at Kim's Hospital in Hyderabad. Dr. Manas Panigrahi obtained his MCH neurosurgery at Nimhans, Bangalore. He's been, he has a wealth of knowledge and 16 years of experience as a neurosurgeon. He has special interest in skull base surgery, vascular surgery, endoscopic neurosurgery, and epilepsy surgery. He is a member of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Surgery Care Program at KIMS and has performed more than 650 epilepsy surgeries. He has pioneered the deep brain stimulation for Parkinson disease and performed more than 100 DBS surgeries. He was awarded the Japanese Society of Churl Neurology Award for excellent paper on hemispherotomy in children at the 14th annual meeting of Infantine Seizure Society 2012 in Tokyo, Japan. Dr. Manas, welcome. Dr. H. V. Madhusudan, Chief Neurosurgeon, BGS Hospital. He is an expert in all brain and spine procedures, including tumor removal, device implantations, and minimal access spinal surgeries. He is credited with doing the first lum lumbar disc displacement and interspinous device implantation of Karnataka in 2006. He is also an expert in all the latest in micro neurosurgery, frameless navigation, and endoscopic neurosurgery as well. Dr. Madhusudan has been awarded the prestigious Indira Gandhi Priyadarshini Award for his outstanding services and achievements and contribution to his field of work. He has been awarded Parimala Award for his outstanding work and contribution in the field of neurosciences. Dr. Welcome. The second panelist is Dr. Maheshwarappa BM, Senior consult Consultant and, and Head uh, at Phys Physical Medicine, Rehabilitation and Sports Medicine, Sakra World Hospital. Dr. Maheshwarappa is one of the most eminent and distinguished physical medicine and rehabilitation specialists in the country. He has extensive knowledge, skill and experience in pain management and rehabilitation of traumatic and non-traumatic conditions of orthopedics, spine neurological condition. His keen interest in disability and challenges of patients with neurological disorders made him to join three-year senior residency program in neuro Neurological Rehabilitation at Nimhans. Dr. Vijay Kamath, spine surgeon, he has completed MS Orthopedics, FNBE Spinal Surgery, Fellow of Advanced Spinal Surgery, Hong Kong. He has won many awards and quite a lot of, and, and, and quite a lot of publications. His areas of expertise are microsurgery for lumbar and cervical disc problems and stenosis. Minimally invasive spine surgery for fusion, scoliosis and kyphosis, human back deformity corrections, surgery for infections and tumor, osteoporotic fracture, vertebroplasty, services in both surgical and rehabilitative care of spinal disorders. Dear panelists and, and chairperson, welcome to the session. We look forward to have a good session on neurological disorders, treating neurological disorders in the country. Dr. Manas, over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, good afternoon. Um, the title is like a treatment of neurological disability. Um, as a layman, uh, everybody thinks that neurosurgery or neurology involves disability. Uh, but that concept probably is uh, 20 years old. Uh, it's not true now. Uh, here now, uh, no means only few patients of neurosurgery or neurology become disabled or uh, chronic. And uh, so what we are looking at as uh, ability of neurosurgery patient rather than disability. Uh, so the whole... Uh, but the first talk will be by Dr. Madhusudan, not... The first talk by Dr. Madhusudan, please. 
change the slides. I'll go, I'll go later. Uh, so we have chosen three topics, and Dr. Madhusudan will be speaking on uh, uh, keyhole surgery, and, uh, and then we'll have Dr. Maheshwarappa who will be speaking on what are the uh, recent advances to make a disabled person more able and uh, then uh, we'll have a more of a cosmetic surgery uh, like deformity of spine uh, as uh, if we are looking at medical tourism and uh, there is no point in discussing on acute treatment we have to look at uh, uh, chronic treatment and india uh, in the medical tourism cosmetic uh, spine deformity correction is important which dr vijay kamath will speak and uh, last i'll speak on uh, surgery for uh, epilepsy uh, so i'll request dr madhu to start on the talk <coughs> Uh, at the outset, I'd like to th thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's nice to see so many people who are involved in the medical tourism. In fact, when I first accepted this, I did not realize that there are going to be so many people. Uh, and since most of the people are non-medical, I'll try and show a few things, like what Dr. Manas was telling, neurological uh, <clears throat> diseases are no longer disability-oriented. They're more curative-oriented. Uh, and uh, if you look at the medical tourism itself, the number of people who require treatment as far as the brain-related brain diseases and spinal cord-related diseases are a huge number. And uh, many of these uh, diseases are chronic diseases. I mean, they are uh, not acute care and patients can travel overseas and get uh, very high-end uh, treatment uh, done. And uh, most of the diseases which require treatment as far as the brain and spinal cord are concerned require extensive medical technology. It requires expert doctors and extensive years of training and expertise. Uh, one of the key areas in India is the number of patients that a given surgeon or a given doctor sees is huge in number. So the, the kind of expertise and the kind of uh, treatment which can be rendered is of very high standards. And it's in fact as good as anywhere in the, the world, either in the West or the East. Uh, I thought I'd focus on uh, minimal access neurosurgery because uh, like all the surgical treatments, the, even neurosurgery is going towards a daycare. Uh, many of our patients are treated as daycare or a single day stay in the hospital. And uh, this is possible because of the uh, minimal access. It reduces the ICU stay. It reduces the hospital stay. Uh, the patient has less pain and discomfort because the tissue handling is reduced. Because, uh, because not much of uh, tissue is handled there is reduced risk of infection, and many of them are being able to be mobilized and returned to work, and uh, they're able to get back into normal uh, work very early. And uh, many of the tumor surgeries are done through the nose and uh, through the skull base endoscopy where there is not even an incision seen on the surface of the body, and also the blood loss and uh, requirement for blood products and others are reduced. Uh, like I said, we have extensive equipment available in India. Whatever is available anywhere in the world is available with us here. And most of the surgeons are well trained, both locally as well as internationally. And uh, because we have a large patient population and the number of surgeries performed is large per surgeon, the learning curve is significantly shortened. Uh, what I will do is I'll just in view of uh, the short period of time that has been given, I'm just going to show you a lot of uh, couple of pictures as to how the patient is before surgery and after surgery to get an idea. Uh, this is a corridor which we use for uh, minimal access through the nose. Uh, this is a typical uh, OT setup where you have uh, where you have the endoscope in one area. We have navigation, microscope, uh, CM, all the various gadgets which are coming together to help us in uh, treating uh, skull base. Uh, this is a typical uh, patient with a cellar supracellar tumor. Uh, this white thing, what you see in the center. Uh, pointer. 
working, sorry. So this white thing in the center that you're seeing is actually, uh, is actually the, this is the white color thing is the, actually the tumor. And these patients, many of them present with just headaches and some little bit of visual deficits. You can hardly make out they're harboring something as big as this. And this is after surgery that you can see that the tumor is completely gone. And uh, the vision which was completely lost has uh, within less than about a month has significantly uh, improved. And uh, even the hormonal treatment, I mean hormonal uh, assay is normal. And if you see this patient, you can barely make out that she's undergone a major brain tumor surgery about two weeks ago. And the entire surgery is done through the nose and one day of ICU stay, one day of hospital stay. And in two weeks time, she is back to doing her normal activity. And th this is the beauty of uh, uh, minimal access surgery. And, uh, and this is the way forward. This is an example to show you how this, this is a patient who has undergone the same tumor where you can see multiple uh, incisions on the head. And whereas this is the same, this is another boy who has undergone the same surgery two weeks ago. So minimal access neurosurgery really has taken us uh, a long way. Of course, this is a patient who has a huge tumor. Uh, hopefully we will be able to do this uh, in the near future through minimal access, but of course, this is scan done after surgery which shows total excision. Uh, here, of course, we had to do through the skull. But even in a patient like this with the advances in the neuroanesthesia and uh, uh, microneurosurgery, this patient is less than 12 hours since a major uh, brain tumor surgery. And most of these patients are leaving the hospital in less than four to five days and they are in a state to travel back to their country in less than uh, two weeks' time. Uh, this is a special equipment which we call as the neuro -navig navigation. It is basically developed for the uh, aeronautical uh, uh, services. But this will help us look beyond the surface. Uh, and this will help us guide exactly sub-millimeter precision to where we want to go as far as brain surgery and spinal cord surgery is concerned. And this has reduced the risk of uh, injury to the patient significantly. This is, a, this is another scan of a baby with a large ventricle. Normally we would do something called as a shunt which involves uh, putting a tube from brain to the stomach. But we can, and this is how the child looks with severe raised ICP features. Uh, we can do the same with the endoscope, which involves a small opening in the skull, and uh, we introduce this balloon into the brain, and we make an opening into the floor of the brain. And this is a child exactly less than 10 days from surgery. You can see the small uh, incision that is used here. And these kind of surgeries are dramatic, and they're very satisfying. And if you have a couple of patients like this, they themselves will start referring their relatives to come and get it done with us, which is what is happening uh, many a times. Uh, similar to the brain, we can also do minimal access in spine. Uh, this is a patient, young patient with a fracture, L2 fracture, uh, that here you can see there is spinal cord compression. He had weakness and bowel bladder difficulties. And, uh, we can use these uh, minimal access towers where we put percutaneous screws. So the amount of dissection, amount of uh, blood loss and everything is significantly reduced. And uh, this is him at six months, uh, completely healed up. And if you see the scan, it's, I mean, if you see the patient itself, he's got these tiny less than centimeter incisions. And most of these patients because of reduced uh, uh, tissue dissection, reduced blood loss, they are able to get back to normal work in less than about uh, two weeks. They are able to get up and walk around on the next day of surgery, many times even on the same day of surgery. So minimal access, both in terms of brain as well as in terms of spine, has come a long way. And uh, 
And a lot of patients who are overseas where this kind of technology is not available, this kind of expertise is not available, can really, really benefit from these uh, uh, procedures. Uh, so in, in conclusion, minimal access neurosurgery is safe, it is effective, extremely patient friendly, and most importantly, it is also extremely cost effective because it reduces the time of hospital stay, the time of ICU stay, requirement of blood products, and most importantly, return to work can happen very quickly. Thank you for a patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madhu. Uh, as we are running short of time, we'll first finish the lectures and later we'll open for discussion. Uh, I request uh, uh, Dr. Mahesh Rapa from Sakra Hospital uh, to give his lecture. <coughs> Good afternoon to everyone. The neurological disability, it doesn't just involve weakness of hands and legs so that he cannot walk or he cannot perform activities. It's a multi-sector involvement of brain, brain functions, like higher mental functions. It can lead to disability. If person cannot have, can have a, he cannot remember, he cannot think, calculate, cannot speak. So these are, these are all disabilities. And also, he, he may have a bowel and bowel bladder incontinence. This is also leads because of neurological disability. So, <clears throat> what I mean to say, neurological disability means most of the people think that go and do exercise, that is a treatment. Now, the, there are neurological disorders, whether it's a traumatic or non-traumatic, it ends up with the disability. The multiple disabilities. So, if the, the, <clears throat> the, the burden of disability can be reduced, if the quality medical treatment, quality surgical interventions, and acute phase of uh, the quality neuro rehabilitation, if the neurosurgery and the neuro neurologist can do a good job, when patient comes to, if, if he doesn't do, undergo neuro rehabilitation, he may end up with neurological disability. So, what neuro rehabilitation does? Neuro rehabilitation prevents many, many medical complications. The patient, the cost of medical, uh, the cost of the treatment for the neurological illness, it's not because of the primary problem, it's because of secondary me medical complications. Like say, head injury, successful surgery is done by neurosurgeon and patient go home develops multiple complications, bed sore, pneumonia, DVT, contracture, deformity, and multiple. So each complication costs much more than the primary disease like surgery for the spine. So neuro, if neuro rehabilitation is good, we can prevent medical complications, we can um, uh, reduce the um, uh, morbidity and mortality, and improve the quality of life. So what do we need? So, Many hospitals in, Bang in uh, India, in the country, started giving importance to rehab, neuro rehabilitation. So, neuro rehab should have a proper, any hospital where the results has to be good, they should have a proper neuro rehabilitation setting. That is dedicated floor in, in the same hospital, immediately taken over by the neuro rehab. So, it needs a, inpatient and outpatient, the treatment, the rehabilitation, and also it needs a comprehensive, qualified professionals, rehab experts. So, we, who caters to the patient care, like neurophysiatrist, who has done in a MD rehabilitation, and then undergoes, again, a specialization in neuro rehabilitation, who can deliver proper rehabilitation protocol. Then we have a team where neurophysiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, psychologist, nutritionist, and orthotics. So the entire team becomes a, the more dedicated towards person to bring out and from the disability make him independent in community. So along with the neuro rehabilitation team, and we need a 
technology to deliver a, the, the quality, to get a quality Like the list, if you can see this, this the each, the equipment cost a lot. But if the rehab has got a, this setup, we can deliver good quality uh, uh, results. So the, the department should have a neuro rehab setting, should have a globally approved procedures, the rehab clinical qualified quality indicators, and individual attention by one to one, and quality time spent during the rehab, about two hours and morning and two hours of afternoon, the day, nearly about four hours of session of rehab will give a <coughs> better results. Patient safety issues, effective communication, patient and family education, and detailed and timely documentation, and also accreditation by one of the NABH. And also we need HDO and ICU backup because these patients can develop any complication during the stay. So these are the, some the neurological disorders, commonly stroke we come across, and neurosurgical uh, disorders, so traumatic brain injury, and also spinal, um, the spinal cord injuries, compressed myelopathy, spinal tumors. And there are pediatric disorders with uh, deformity. So what derives the neuronal plasticity or neuronal recovery? After the initial treatment, is it a medicine or it is a rehab? So to re the many results, literature shows the latent, after the immediate treatment, it's a rehab which give, makes a new, neuronal recovery. So when to start? It should be started in the ICU, not at the community, not at when patient is completely stable at the time of discharge from the hospital. So the team should have a speech therapist which give, who evaluate for speech and swallowing, and they work on swallowing and speech. And occupational therapy, they work on hands, fine motor and the gross motor, so that he can perform hand activities and perform, get back to his job. So neurocognitive training, and uh, the, there we work on the attention, knowledge, memory, judgment, restoration of problem solving, and decision making, these things. So we need a orthotist who can work on making a fabricated orthosis so that the patient can be mobilized. We need an advanced tilt table. We, have a, we should have a, something special walkers to mobilize early. Functional electrical stimulation, where we can use the electric modality to make person early walk. So balance masters and gait analyzer, and also motor mates, which machine works on the weaker hands and legs to improve the strength, and biodex balance master, and there are TeraBand stations to improve the strength, and hand and finger equipments to improve the hand fine motors, virtual reality training where the, the patient can see his body movements and perform some of the game activity to improve. And we should have a very good, the, uh, the, the strength equipments to improve the strength of the patient. And also, in the future, we are thinking of even go ahead with the tele-rehabilitation where some of the home-based program can be monitored from the hospital. And there are patients who need a surgery. Like even after, during the rehabilitation, we know that this patient will get benefit. So we send them to neurosurgeon. They do the rhizotomy and intrathecal baclofen pump and the DBS. So they come back, they go and then get the intervention and come back to rehab. So what is the cost of this? If you look at, the, this is not the liter from the literature, the data, what we have. It is through friends we got the information. The cost of the treatment in, of any neurological disorders for a month stay in a single standard, it comes to about 58 lakh in the US. And it's 38 lakh rupees in UK. It comes to, sorry, in Canada. And nearly about the 30 lakh in UK. Singapore, nearly about 23 lakh. So in India, we do not have, but our hospital stay, which is for the international patients, it was coming around 5 lakh if patient doesn't develop any medical complications. So I'll go to some of the, how the rehab, one of the example I give through this video, where patient with the severe stroke and spinal cord injury, how they, can you just switch on the video, please? This is the entire floor 
is for the rehab, neurological rehabilitation. Where all the equipments are placed, high end technology. And we discuss with the each patient, with every team members will join regarding the uh, case discussion. And patients with the spinal cord injury, we put them into the treadmill with uh, the body weight support and uh, gait training, functional electrical stimulations, and biofeedback and also balance posture. And wheelchair activity, wheelchair mobilization, functional skill training for each patient. But this is the CVT, central venous thrombosis, cerebral venous thrombosis, where very com patient was in coma and at the right hemiplegia, there was completely uh, uh, aphasia, global aphasia. With the intensive neuro rehabilitation, she could make the meaningful uh, the uh, life. Just imagine she just delivered one one week back the baby, and she landed up with the hemiplegia. This is a patient has a massive stroke. If you look at his scan, half the brain is not there in the scan. But if you look at the way he is doing with the left hemiplegia, left hand and left leg weakness, he recovered back. And this is a patient with hypoxic brain injury. One month he was in coma stage. He was shifted from one of the other hospitals for the rehab. And at the end of one and a half month to two months of rehab in the hospital, and he's, he has gone back to home. Though he has a little bit of cognitive function, dysfunction, but he could perform exercise and walk back from the hospital. And this is a spinal cord injury, cervical, and he had lost all the four limbs and regained. He came after two to three months of injury and he, he started improving with the intensive neuro rehabilitation. And <coughs> a patient with encephalopathy, was in coma in a different hospital in Bangalore, but he, he was shifted for the rehab to under me, and at the end, he completely, he was an, he's an aeronautic engineer in US, he's a US citizen, he came for treatment to country. She's a scientist with the right uh, 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 cerebral infarct with the left hemiplegia and, and recovered. What we need is, along with the quality treatment, medical treatment and quality rehabilitation and patient, we can reduce the burden of disability and we can make them to live independent life, at least with some supported life. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahesharappa, for the... Uh, mm, means a very explanatory lecture and the effectiveness of uh, rehabilitation uh, which is useful for uh, uh, many patients and where patients can come from other countries and stay for two months and ha go back, uh, come in a wheelchair and go back walking. Uh, the next paper is uh, by Dr. Vijay Kamath uh, uh, from Baptist Hospital and he'll be speaking on deformity correction. <coughs> uh, sitting down there in the morning session, uh, I was a little concerned about the talk, wondering if it would be appropriate for this or whether it had to be given in a medical college. But after meeting a lot of y'all, I'm pretty convinced that this is the right forum for this. Now, when a patient decides to have spinal surgery, we as doctors would generally think the patient's concerns would be, is it a simple or a complex surgery? Is it minimally invasive or open? But the actual truth of the matter is that patients' concerns and expectations are different. What he's looking at is expertise of the surgeon and the hospital, safety, both for medical care and his own personal safety, his or her personal safety, affordability, definitely, the hospitality, as well as the follow-up care and whether he could contact his doctor. And that's why it's a destination India. Because we have the surgical expertise, we have large teams, and our surgeons, because of the sheer volumes that they do, they get very good at it. And in fact, nowadays, we get doctors coming in from abroad to train here as well. The outcomes most often are quite excellent and comparable with that from abroad. 
The facilities and the equipment and the implants available are second to none, including navigation, neuromonitoring to improve the safety, all the latest equipment in the OTs as well as the implants. There's a very good safety record. More important than anything else is the ethical practice, and we lay a lot of emphasis on this as to not do any un unrequired procedures and make sure that the patients get what they absolutely deserve and nothing more. Affordability, well, there was a lot of talk this morning about not projecting affordability, but I'll come to that a little later. Indian hospitality is unparalleled, there's no doubt about it, and every, everybody across the world acknowledges that, be it in hospital or whether it's outside the hospital. And most importantly, we have a wonderful country to travel and visit, and that makes India a really good destination for health. Now, coming to the spinal, specifics of spinal care, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about spinal deformity here, which is mainly the two deformities are scoliosis, where there's a sideward bend, as can be seen here, and okay, where there's a sideward bend in the spine, and while most people think this would be only a cosmetic problem, the truth of the matter is severe bends can also compromise their breathing as well as their heart condition over time. And so it's not just a cosmetic surgery that we're looking at. We're looking at improving their cosmosis, but also their general health, and it adds a totally different dimension to their life. What I'm gonna showcase here is the kind of work that would go on in India, but these are the cases done by our spine team in Bangalore Baptist Hospital. You can see this young girl here who had a very significant bend of her spine, and through a, a surgery performed under neuromonitoring, she came out very safely with a straight spine. This is another example of a patient who had a very significant deformity with some breathing issues, and after surgery, she did very well. Now, when we talk about surgery, we need to project to patients the quality. And I don't see a reason why, if you're doing good quality work, which is affordable, we should not project that to patients as well, because there's nothing like good quality work which is affordable. These are also, this is another patient where we have done the surgery from the front, and you can see a marked improvement in her standing. You know, the abnormal folds in her, lo in her loin are gone, and she came out very happy. We also get patients who have not only just a bend in the spine, but a bend because their bones are not formed properly, as you can see where the arrows are, and these need to be treated early. If left alone, they can cause very gross deformities. And you can see, we go in and remove those extra, those partially formed vertebra, and then straighten them up as well. These, some of these deformities need to be done in very young children. Like this girl from Nigeria who came in, she was just reaching her fourth birthday, but she had a very significant deformity of her spine. And with her growth, this could have progressed to become very large. And some of these neglected cases from the 50 degree could even reach 120 degrees by the time they reach skeletal maturity. That is, in other words, complete their growth phase. So they need to be tackled early. And it needs a lot of expertise to be able to get these vertebrae out and manage these children. And you need not only a good anesthetic team, but also a very good backup by ICUs, uh, including your intensivists and your pediatrics team. Hunchback deformity, again, can be very disfiguring for patients. And if you look at this nine-year-old child who had tuberculosis when she was young, I mean, the deformity is really uh, bad. She also began developing defo you know, weakness of the limbs. And you can't leave these deformities and wait for them to grow up. That's a sort of a myth that we have to wait for these children to grow up and only then do it. These are tackled, the earlier they're tackled, the better. And you can see we've got an excellent correction here. And again, the cost of surgery, very minimal if you compare it. It's less than one-fifth of what it would cost in, say, Thailand and Singapore, and less than a tenth of what it would cost in the US of A. These are other examples of patients who have operated. Another 21-year-old girl who had a very gross deformity, wasn't getting proposals to get married, and after her deformity, she went back, and she got engaged, and she came back to give us that good news. So it was very satisfying. And this is another child who had achondroplasia. This is where the children don't grow. And you know, when they have a deformity, it can be difficult for them to manage. We also get deformities in elderly patients from a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. 
Essentially what happens is the spine bends over and it all gets fused up and they can't stand up. And you can see this person is literally looking at his toes when he's walking. And you know, a, a surgery done at the lower part of the spine, as can be seen there on that last picture, you can see there's a gross improvement in his standing and he's able to look straight ahead and that makes a big difference to his social life as well as uh, not only his social life as well as his breathing and his heart which is beginning to get compromised. We also do deformities of the cervical spine that is here you can see there was a slippage of what we call the first vertebra over the second and also a kyphosis that is a forward bending of the spine with compression of the spinal cord and this is treated by a surgery from behind. This was another complex cervical surgery done in an 85 year old lady and she had a lot of difficulty a lot of difficulty. You can see her neck is bent over. She could hardly support her head. And we did a surgery from the back and the front. And she did well after that. The cost, again, it's very important to highlight this here. Very significantly lower compared to others. Pediatric cervical spine is another area of expertise in our country. And we do that as well. You can see this child with his neck bent over because the first vertebra had slipped over the second and he did very well after surgery. We've also done some very rare surgeries, like there are very few case reports of surgery or instrumentation of the spine being done in children less than two years of age, or very less, I mean very few, less than four years of age. I'm talking about worldwide. And we had the opportunity of doing it for this child who was just, reached, just 20 months old, and was one of the first. And we had to do it because she was losing no power in her upper limbs and lower limbs and couldn't walk. Also fractures can be treated well. You can get realign the spine very well, both in the neck and also in the lower spine. And these can be done minimally invasive as, uh, as elucidated by our previous speaker. Surgery for infection, we do get a lot of patients coming with complete destruction of the vertebral body and we deconstruct it with cages filled with bone graft and implants there as well. Another example of a young patient who had lost power in his lower limbs and went on to improve very well. One of the problems that we are beginning to face more often these days is of fractures in the elderly patients, what we call osteoporotic fractures. And it's becoming, with the increasing uh, po uh, elderly population, we're going to be seeing more of this. And we have got these minimally invasive procedures, what we call a vertebroplasty or a kyphoplasty, where we can inject cement through small little cannulas into the bone, and you can see uh, how the size of the vertebra comes back to normal. And these patients do very well. They can walk the same day after surgery. Spinal fusions, when the bone slips, again can be done minimally invasive or open. Tumors. Tumors is another area which requires a lot of expertise and team care, and this is an example of a young boy who came uh, to us because he was losing power in his lower limbs. He had been treated previously with radio and chemotherapy. And we didn't have a choice but to remove the whole tumor. Now here, in most cases, especially when it's a primary tumor, it becomes important that we try and take the whole tumor out without actually entering the tumor. Because otherwise you cause spillage of the malignant cells and that can you know, compromise the result. So uh, what we had to do here was a very extensive surgery and this is a Again, not a very commonly performed surgery, so it needs a very significant backup from your anesthetist and your ICU people, and of course, your colleagues as well. Very, very important team effort. Here you can see that we have removed the vertebral body. You can see the spinal cord lying free there, and we have reconstructed the rib cage with a mesh. And on the top there, you can see the whole tumor removed in toto. And then, of course, we reconstructed the spine, and this is at follow-up where you can see the bone graft that we have put in the cage and outside has healed up very well, giving him a complete stability of the spine. So the spine services available in India uh, cover every aspect. I mean, from deformities, microsurgeries, minimally invasive surgeries, of course the brain has already described, rehabilitation has already described in detail, and hence the patients can really benefit from coming to uh, our country. In summary, well, the healthcare infrastructure in India is all, we can say, is comparable to the Western countries. The medical care, the expertise, and the outcomes are, are at, at par with international standards. Low cost, when you're providing quality, is a definite, definite benefit. 
no compromise on quality, ethics, and patient safety. And of course, the warm and wonderful country makes it all the better to come to India. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kamat. Uh, can I have my slides, please? Uh, so all this morning, we were uh, all discussing about uh, uh, what is bad in medical tourism in, in India. You have a bad uh, taxi driver or a um, bad outcome in the patient. Uh, we doubt the ethics of the doctor. We have not looked at the ability of Indian uh, medical tourism. Uh, look first at the ability the disability. Disability can be overcome, like visa has been overcome. Uh, the, we can have a, a better hospitality that can be overcome. But look at the ability of the doctors, of the nurses, and the medical facilitators who who are ready to work for a lesser remuneration. That's how we are. That's why we are cheaper. It's not that the quality the cheap is substandard. We are cheap because we we are ready to work as a service provider rather than making profit. The whole system works for as a service. That's why we are cheaper. We use the same implant what is used in US. Use the same medicines what is used in US. The cost is less because those implants are available for one tenth the cost. Dr. Guravardi will tell again. It's one tenth the cost, or sometimes one. Uh, it is 20, 20 times less than what is available in, in, in the US. Uh, now I'll show a series of pictures. All of you have to tell me what is common among them. Uh, this is Alfred Nobel. This is Isaac Newton. This is Julius Caesar, Napoleon Bonaparte, and Alexander the Great, uh, Socrates the Greek philosopher, Aristotle. Uh, can you tell me what is common among all of them? Uh, yeah, correct, you're right. Uh, anybody else? Means I don't have tickets for Malaysia, but, uh, <laughs> but I can give a chocolate. <laughs> anybody else? Okay. Now that's why they became big, they became celebrities. Uh, all of them had epilepsy, uh, and, and then still they are celebrities. Whereas in, if you look at internet, uh, you look for a celebrity in, of India in having epilepsy, will not find it. Because we have, not even in Middle East also, not even in African, because in the developing world, uh, it's a stigma, social stigma. Uh, so what I'm talking to, to, to you today is about epilepsy and surgery for epilepsy. Not all epilepsy can be treated with medicines. Uh, at least uh, out of 10 patients we, we, op, uh, we treat with medicines, three of them cannot get control with medicines and they need surgery. Now this epilepsy surgery is uh, uh, not very common in many parts of the world. Even in India, there are only few centers which do epilepsy surgery. In India at present, like every year we need 50,000 patients who need surgery, but all over India only 400, 500 patients can, uh, are getting surgery done. And similar situation will be there in African country or many of your uh, developing countries. Even uh, cricketers also had epilepsy and they were very good cricketers. So let me talk about surgery for epilepsy. As it's uh, uh, only 10% are medical uh, crowd, I just given a video animation of what is epilepsy. Now epilepsy is a disorder where there is a abnormal uh, uh, abnormal activity in the brain and which passes as, as an electrical current to all over the body. So if any part of the brain is abnormal, when it discharges abnormally, that is manifested by different excessive movement of different parts of the body, like this child. See, the child was okay, fine, and suddenly there was an epileptic discharge or an epileptic fit, and then this kind of attack can, is, can be disastrous to many, ch many uh, the children or adults who have this kind of disease. How do they manifest depend on which part of the brain is affected, whether the front part, frontal lobe, or the, uh, or the temporal lobe, or like the, the part in front of the ear, or the front part, or the back part. The different manifestation depends on where is the abnormality. So what do we do in a surgery? We sur we in, in surgery, we identify which is the abnormal part and remove that part of the brain. 
Now I was looking at uh, one journal uh, which I read yesterday in African Health Science, which came in March 2015. Spectrum of neurological complications following medical tourism. They, they reported 23 patients who were operated in uh, different parts of the world. Half of them were from India, and still uh, some of them had gone to Germany also in European countries. And out of 23, nine of them died when they came back to their own country. This gives a very bad uh, message that whether medical tourism should be promoted or not. Now all this, and they said that irrespective whether it is India or an European country, they still did bad because they did not screen the patients properly or they did not choose the disease, which disease has to be sent. Like deformity, which Dr. Kamath presented, or minimally invasive surgery, which Dr. Uh, Madhu presented, or for rehabilitation they can come. If you send a patient with head injury or a spinal trauma, obviously they will have bad prognosis. And if the patient is sent back before rehabilitation is done, they will die of complications. And then the blame goes on the treating physician. And they have to be also explained about the disease. Half of the brain tumors which are operated are cancerous. So they have a limited lifespan. So unless the patients and the relatives and the caregiver and the medical facilitator knows about the disease, they think that it's a surgical failure or a treatment failure. And so we should not have many papers like this, which comes out in scientific journal, and then that will be a, a big drawback to this uh, industry. So what we did was first try it with our complication. We have done, by this time, we published this last year. By this time, we have done 800 of epilepsy surgery, and we published. Uh, Dr. Uma Nambiar has left, but she told that uh, uh, you are asking about uh, credibility. Now, uh, though in, we are in private, but uh, after I moved, I, I worked for 14 years in a government setup, and I, for, for the past six years in a private. But then, uh, when I worked in US, I realized that credibility is important. So I published more in private than in government. And uh, so one day of our work is dedicated for this. We published this in World Neurosurgery last year. That is not with our outcome or results, but our complications. So complications of epilepsy surgery. This gives credibility for the patients to come and the referring doctors and the medical facilitators to, to get convinced that we do equally good treatment. Now this, I'll give an example. Now this is a child. This is an 11-year-old child who used to have uh, epilepsy from two years of age. He used to get every day, five to six, and he had a normal IQ. Now you can see here, the MRI had shown an abnormality in the front part of the brain. And I hope the video opens. You can see here, the child was sitting. Suddenly, he uh, drops down the head. and. Uh, the uh, uh, hands are uh, stiff and then make cyclical movement of the legs. If not seen by a neurologist, sometimes these are taken as psychiatric problem and then they kept on treated as psychiatric disease. But these are kind of seizures which can be diagnosed with EEG and MRI. So we did an EEG and then we identified, we confirmed that the whatever seen in the MRI is the abnormal focus and the, the, the electrical activity confirmed from the EEG that it comes from that area and that part of the brain was removed and the child is seizure free now. This is again another child who had only uh, abnormal movement of the only the right leg. And we did a MRI, there was some lesion here and when you did a PET scan, uh, a SPECT scan, this, this hyperintensity, this hyperintensity or this uh, light, uh, bright light uh, spot tells that this is the abnormal area and this patient also had a surgery and that part was removed. Now this is another boy who had, uh, this video you have seen, who had a, uh, a very violent uh, type of hyper uh, seizures and here the abnormality was in the front part of the brain here which was removed and the chi child is seizure free. Now all this to diagnose, we need a better infrastructure. We need a video EG room, we need a PET scan, we need a SPECT scan, and, uh, so, and, and a high-end MRI also, three Tesla MRI, so that you can identify that the focus, whatever seen in the MRI, that is responsible for the fits, and once you remove that, it can be seizure free. So when you plan for a surgery, we need a, to do a video uh, EEG, we need to do a high-end uh, high MRI like a three Tesla, we need to do a PET scan and PET scan. Sometimes we do invasive monitoring, like put electrodes directly into the brain and record for seven days and identify which is the focus and then remove. 
So whenever we have a patient with epilepsy, the first step of treatment is treat with medicine. And if it doesn't work, we go for surgery. It's not that everyone who comes, we tell that go for surgery as a surgeon. We first try with two medicines for two years. And if they fail, then only they are candidates for to go for surgery. Now, what happens if we don't uh, treat or don't do surgery? Now, you can, this, is the, this is the two brain. This is the brain of a normal person, and this is the brain of a person of epileptic patient who died. You can say because of persistent fits, the development is, is uh, the growth of the brain is affected. And in turn, even if this person, epileptic patient survives, he'll have behavioral problems and low IQ. That's why the surgery, if, at a, if the medicines fail, surgery has to be done at younger age. The younger the child is operated, the better is the outcome. So to, to decide what surgery to be done, uh, I'll not go into these details, as they're more difficult, but I'll just explain about how we use the GPS technology, what you use in phone. Anybody can be tracked in the room with your phone, whether you are here or your wife can know you are in Bangalore or you are in somewhere else by your phone. Similarly, uh, in, 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 when you operate in brain, we use the same technology where in, uh, in a GPS, there is a satellite and there is Earth and there is a, your GPS machine. So in brain also, the head is like uh, Earth and this navigation machine, which Dr. Madhu also showed, is like the satellite or the optical source, and then we can navigate any part of the brain uh, in the central part or even with a small lesion so that we do not miss what is abnormal. And we, we don't also mistake right and left, as Sri Devi's mother had in US long ago that they was operated on the opposite side. If you use navigation, you will always be on the right side. And you can, even small lesion can be pinpointed and then operated. This is how you do in the theater, point out where is the lesion, make, and then so that you can reduce the size of the uh, opening what we make, and find out the brain, uh, identify, do some recording which is the abnormal part of the brain, and take out the part which is abnormal. It can be done in children also. Here you can see, you can see, you can, you, we mark on the, on the uh, um, skull where is the tumor, and then do the incision and operate. And then use, during surgery also we sometimes uh, uh, do electrical recording to identify that that is, that, that is hyperexcitable before we remove the tumor or the lesion. Now many times we do surgery. Suppose uh, uh, like this patient who had a lesion in the Broca's area. Now the Broca's area is in the left part of the frontal lobe here, which is responsible for speech. Now if I remove that, the patient cannot speak later. Now to avoid that the patient doesn't develop any speech problem post-op, we do under awake. The patient is conscious, will be talking to us during surgery, can see here, and then we stimulate, and then identify both the leg movement and identify the speech also. We try to we'll tell the patient to count from 1 to 10. And if you are working on the speech area, the patient cannot count. That's how we save the, uh, the important areas so the post-operatively the patient have less of complications. Now there are some newer developments in epilepsy like one can do deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation is like uh, uh, putting an electrode in the central part of the brain and uh, like here, and then give high frequency stimulation, and that, that reduces the hyper excitability. Now, deep, this is used both for Parkinson's as well as epilepsy. We, one has to use stereotactic apparatus for this. There are scarless surgery like uh, gamma knife or cyber knife or X knife, like uh, patients who cannot undergo general anesthesia because of they have uh, hypertension or they have a heart disease, they can go for radio surgery. The latest is using ultrasound, MR guided high, uh, high frequency ultrasound. Uh, it is still not come to India, uh, but in US also it is still under clinical trial. So what do you do? If, if you find a single lesion, we can remove. But many times, we don't find a single lesion. We find multiple lesions. If you find a multiple lesion, you cannot remove the whole brain and, and tell that you are seizure free. If you find multiple lesions, one has to do deep brain stimulation, or vagal nerve stimulation, where you place a pacemaker, what the same similar type of pacemaker what is used for the heart is placed in the, uh, in the body of the patient with epilepsy, and that stimulates the vagal nerve. That in turn ca causes reduction on the hyperexcitability of the brain. 
This is how it's put placed on the nerve in the neck. So we don't, there is no brain surgery. It's put in the neck and then the, the, because of hyperexcitation, it inhibits the brain. In a deep brain stimulation, we place a pacemaker and the electrode is placed in the thalamus of the uh, anti-nucleus of the thalamus. And that, because of the stimulation, it again inhibits the hyperexcitability and reduces the seizure. It's not that if you operate, everybody is seizure free. When you operate 10 people, only 70 to 80 percent are seizure free. That has to be clear to the patient that you, we cannot assure you a particular patient will come under the 20 to 30 percent group or 70 to 80 percent. But at least if he doesn't go for surgery, 100 percent he is not, he will be suffering. At, if you operate 70 to 80 percent of the time, he'll be free of seizures. It's a misconception that when he goes for brain surgery, that it's a death sentence or he'll be disabled and he'll need prolonged rehabilitation. Of all the cases which you have, we published last year in 700 cases, we had only 1% uh, risk of death and disability of 4%. In conclusion, epilepsy surgery is safe and effective and it has become effective with the new technology. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if there are any questions for any one of us, we are free to ask. Yes. I have one question. Two After care, yeah. Uh, my question yeah. was on aftercare because these are complex surgeries, right? So yeah. once the patients go back to their countries, what mechanism do you have for uh, follow-up and uh, things like that? Yeah, Dr. Maheshwarapa, can you answer like rehab after they finish rehab for one month at, in India? I think especially this uh, epileptic surgery, post of very few, uh, few develops complications. Majority will be will have, not have a uh, deficits. Very few will have a mild weakness, but with the proper exercise program and uh, some of the, if there is a cognitive deficit, some cognitive retraining can uh, go through. Home based program can be given. It is not going to be a major challenging for that in the deficit, especially the epileptic surgery. So, in, in terms of uh, brain tumor surgeries and others which we routinely perform, uh, all the patients have our numbers, they have our email, they are on WhatsApp contact, and uh, many a times they have access to CT scans and MRIs and local physicians. So what, what we tell them is that whenever there is a problem, they directly contact us. And many a times they go to their local physician, they get a scan done, they get, uh, they send us the images, they send us the reports, and some of the places we also are, uh, I work in BGS uh, Bangalore Global Hospitals. We have telemedicine facilities and we are also running outpatient uh, clinics also, camps, regular camps. So I think uh, a lot of these patients and many of them do travel back for uh, maybe sometimes six months, one year down the line, they do come back for uh, thing. And with the, the present uh, mobile facility available, they never ever feel that they're not in contact. So almost every single patient has our personal number. Uh, that's, that's how we have been managing the situation. Actually, intensive aftercare is required more in uh, trauma, either head injury or spine injury. Uh, but rest of all the neurosurgical, uh, either spine operations, do not need much of after aftercare uh, because the morbidity and mortality has significantly come down. Thank you. And the second question I had was from your presentation, Dr. Manas, where we saw one slide where an epileptic patient has an underdeveloped brain compared to a normal person. Yeah. So the recommendation was that epileptic patient undergoes surgery as early as possible. Whereas in the beginning of the session, there was a slide which showed uh, some great achievers uh, in the 16th century. So I was unable to connect that. Uh, not know. 16th century, in 20th century also we have, a, I, I showed the cricketers also. Um, the people who have recurrent seizures, who do not get control with medicines, they have reduced brain development. But people who get controlled with medicines, they lead a normal life. 
That is why we do not tell epilepsy, a pers uh, epileptic patient. We tell a person with epilepsy. They are normal persons. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd like to thank Anita for giving the opportunity. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Madhu, Dr. Kamath, and Dr. Mahesharapa for uh, giving a good lecture and good session.